Part of being a pilot is to observe the weather. Having up-to-date information is absolutely crucial in the safe operation of an aircraft. Weather is constantly changing and sometimes can be unpredictable. On a Texas summer's day in 1985, a large passenger plane would fall victim to a meteorological phenomenon which can be deadly to pilots and be totally invisible. Delta Airlines Flight 191, while on final approach into Dallas, Texas, undershot the runway colliding with a car on a nearby highway before crashing into an airport structure on the ground, killing 136 people on the plane and a further one on the ground. Just what did the crew of this Delta flight fly into on this approach? Delta Airlines Flight 191 left the city of Fort Lauderdale, Florida at 3.10 p.m. on August 2nd, 1985. The flight will finish in Los Angeles, but first needs to make a stopover at Dallas-Fort Worth Airport in Texas. On this first leg of the trip, there were 163 passengers and crew on board. The plane is a Lockheed L-1011 TriStar, a wide-body trijet, one which was comparable to the McDonnell Douglas DC-10. At its launch in the early 1970s, the L-1011 TriStar was the most sophisticated plane of its time. Lockheed developed new technology which pioneered the more computerized flight decks of today, including the automatic landing feature, the first commercial plane with such a function. 250 of these planes were built between 1970 and 1984. Delta Airlines was the operator with the largest quantity of these planes across different variants with a total of 70 aircraft. It is a plane which Delta operated for nearly 30 years, being retired as recently as 2001. Like the DC-10, the L-1011 TriStar has had a troubled history, albeit not to the extent of the DC-10. In 1972, the first recorded hull loss of a TriStar occurred when a plane crashed into the Florida Everglades, killing 101 people. In 1980, a Saudi L-1011 suffered an in-flight fire leading to the deaths of 301 people after landing in Riyadh. These incidents will be discussed further in future videos. Piloting this Lockheed TriStar on this summer's day in 1985 was a crew of three. 57-year-old Captain Edward Connors had been working for Delta for over 30 years, spending a lot of his early days at the airline flying the prop liners of the 1950s. According to the accident report, he had a reputation for strict adherence to company procedures. Many pilots at Delta spoke positively about the captain, as he would openly accept suggestions from other flight crew members. With over 29,000 logged flight hours, he was a well-respected senior captain. He was joined on the flight deck by his first officer, 42-year-old Rudolf Price. He was known in the company for having exceptional knowledge of the TriStar aircraft. 43-year-old flight engineer Nicholas Nasik joins them as the third member of the crew. Both the first officer and flight engineer had around 6,500 flight hours logged each. Before the departure in Fort Lauderdale, the flight crew paid close attention to the weather forecast at Dallas-Fort Worth Airport. Heavy showers and thunderstorms were forecast, to which the crew discussed before the trip. Their stopover at the airport of Dallas-Fort Worth, which going forward in this video we will simply refer to as Dallas, was and still is one of the largest airports in the world. The airport at the time had a total of five runways. The one runway which Flight 191 was expected to use on their approach was runway 17 left. This runway was equipped with eyeless instruments to help pilots descend to the runway. It was a very warm day in Dallas with temperatures around 38 degrees Celsius. Thunderstorms and moderate rain showers had formed in this weather. Delta Flight 191's trip to Dallas prior to the approach was for the most part uneventful aside from the need to deviate around some storms along the way. The tops of some of these clouds also being several thousand feet higher than even the cruising altitude on this flight. With the time now after 5.30 in the evening, the crew of the flight had begun preparations for landing. At 5.35, the crew receive an Automated Terminal Information Service message, or ATIS for short. These messages provide pilots with appropriate up-to-date weather information at a given airport. The messages are also ended with a letter of the phonetic alphabet to identify which information the flight crew received when conversing with controllers. This was quickly followed up by an air traffic control instruction to clear the flight onto its arrival into Dallas. With this clearance, the crew begin their descent to the airport. 
Several minutes later, at 5.47, air traffic control in Dallas cleared flight 191 to descend down to 10,000 feet and gave an update on the air pressure in the region. The controller also suggested a change of heading to avoid more adverse weather. Captain Connors takes on the controller's suggestion, going on record stating he wishes to fly around the weather, one minute later conversing with the first officer expressing relief of not having to fly through the bumpy weather. A few minutes later at 5.51, Dallas Control comes back on frequency with Flight 191's handoff to the approach controller. Minutes later, the radio frequency the crew were tuned into started to broadcast a weather update. This message included a mention of rain showers just north of the airport, something that the flight crew might want to have been made aware of as this is where they will fly through in the final moments of the flight. At just before 6pm, the flight crew commented on the fact that there was rain ahead. Now at 5,000 feet, there were some aircraft ahead of the Delta plane. An American Airlines flight and a private Learjet aircraft were just in front of the Lockheed TriStar in the landing sequence. To keep space between the planes, Dallas Approach asks Flight 191 to slow their speed to 170 knots. With appropriate spacing, Delta Flight 191 is given instructions to intercept the ILS to turn and line up with the runway several miles out from the airport and to descend down to 2,300 feet to join the glide slope on runway 17 left at Dallas. Flight 191 acknowledged this approach instruction and was then required to slow again this time to 160 knots. At 6.04 in the evening, the landing checklist was performed and the pilots began configuring their plane for landing and as part of this checklist the landing gear was lowered. During this, the first officer observed lightning in a storm cell ahead of the plane. Now descending to the runway, the captain called out 1,000 feet above the ground. First officer Rudolf Price was the one at the flight controls on this flight, Captain Connors handling radio communication and making altitude callouts. Between the plane's current position in the airport, are several major highways which run in and out of Dallas to the surrounding areas. Also between the plane and the airport is an invisible but deadly meteorological phenomenon known as a downburst, particularly the type of downburst which occurs over a small area called a microburst. A microburst is a strong burst of downward air originating from cumulonimbus clouds. These clouds often have the striking appearance of being large and ominous as they tower into the sky. When one of these microbursts occurs, the downdraft of air can exceed thousands of feet per minute and be hazardous to aircraft. Because warm air rises, a parcel of air which is cooler and heavier sinks, sometimes with impressive speed. Once the air hits the ground, it scatters in all directions. Similar to how tap water in a sink can splash in all directions, but on a much larger scale. Some microbursts can be visible because of rain or moisture, but on this occasion, the microburst which Delta Flight 191 would fly through was invisible to the pilots flying. We need to more closely examine how a microburst can affect an aircraft to understand how Delta Flight 191 crashed at Dallas. As air scatters in all directions from a microburst, to the pilots flying through there are three phases. The first, as an aircraft enters the microburst, it is confronted with a strong headwind. Pilots can identify this with an increase in indicated airspeed. Although, during this, the aircraft's ground speed decreases. Pilots may also notice an increase in lift from the headwind. The second phase of flying through a microburst is the downdraft. Wind direction here changes very quickly as a plane passes through it, because wind is now coming from above the plane, not from ahead of it or behind it. Not only will the downdraft push the plane down, but there will also be a significant drop-off in the generation of lift, creating a strong wind shear effect. According to the investigation, it is believed that Delta Flight 191 encountered a horizontal wind shear of about 72 knots. Before we discuss the third phase of a microburst, we should back up and analyse how the flight crew of Flight 191 were caught in one of these downdrafts. At around 6.05pm, Flight 191 entered a microburst just north of runway 17 left at Dallas. First Officer Rudolph Price was still at the flight controls. Captain Connors sat in the left seat, noticed the first officer struggling with the aircraft, initially commenting on the aircraft's speed as lift decreases and the nose of the aircraft rises in the downdraft. The captain emphasizes more thrust on the engines. The cockpit voice recorder captured the engines running at high power. 
With just 600 feet of altitude left, the plane is pushed towards the ground and drops below the glide slope. Flight 191 would enter the third phase of the microburst, the tailwind. Here the winds become unfavorable for landing due to them being behind an aircraft. Having successfully made it through the downdraft, Flight 191 did not have enough speed or lift to climb, and so it landed short of the runway on the grass north of the airport, skewing left of the runway centerline. The cockpit voice recorder does not end when the aircraft collides with the ground short of the runway. Between Flight 191 and the airport is Texas State Highway 114, one of several busy highways running in and out of Dallas. Several eyewitnesses on the ground report the plane making a hard landing on what was roughly one and a quarter miles from the end of the runway, where the TriStar plane then skidded onto the highway. Traveling at roughly 170 knots, the left engine collides with the Toyota Celica. The occupant of the car, 28-year-old William Mabry, was killed instantly. It was his 28th birthday that very day. Looking on from the control tower, the tower controller sees Flight 191 off of the runway and on the grass, where he tells the Delta flight to go around. The cockpit voice recording ends with the second impact, this time with a large water tank on the airport grounds, where the plane then exploded. The tail section was ripped away from the plane and skidded away from the rest of the wreckage. Out of the 163 passengers and crew on board the plane, only 27 survived, most seated at the rear of the aircraft. Some passengers survived from the midsection of the plane, but with severe injury including burns. The National Transportation Safety Board in the United States concluded that the crew's actions were in part to blame for the accident alongside the microburst-induced wind shear. This was because of the flight crew's decision to continue an approach into what was observed evidently by the first officer, an area of sky containing lightning and adverse weather. The lack of training and procedures with regards to avoiding and escaping wind shear were also cited, along with the lack of any kind of wind shear hazard information from the airport. Recommendations were made which included the introduction of an audible warning of wind shear to pilots. Research was invested into developing radar which could detect wind changes. Pilot training now needs to emphasize the avoidance of areas with wind shear. The crash of Flight 191 was one of the deadliest accidents involving the Lockheed TriStar. 1985 went on record as being one of the worst years in aviation history with regards to aviation accidents. Ten days after the Delta Airlines crash at Dallas, a Japan Airlines Boeing 747 crashed in Japan killing 520 people, becoming the worst aviation disaster involving a single plane. Ten days after that, a Boeing 737 erupted into flames in England killing a further 55. The Lockheed L-1011 TriStar was a common aircraft used by major airlines in the United States until the early 2000s, when it was eventually retired. A memorial was installed at Dallas-Fort Worth Airport, dedicated to the 137 people who lost their lives that day in 1985, in what was, and still is, Texas's deadliest aviation disaster. Hello, good evening everyone. I hope you're having a great weekend wherever you are in the world. Just to let you know that next week, starting from Monday 7th of June, I will be taking a week off. Uh, 
but I have prepared a video in advance for next weekend so there will still be a video. Uh, be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out for that one. Anyway, it is that time of the week where I must take a moment to thank my patrons for their support on the channel. If you would like to get your name featured or read out at the end of the next video, you can join the Patreon from £3 per month and the link to that will be in the pinned comment below. And you will also get early access to all new videos two days before they go out publicly on YouTube. A thank you to my £5 tier patrons, Ada Montgomery, Hector Palmatellas, Ian Tatum, Jacopo, KTP123, Ken Zachman, Christy, Leon St. Jennings, Murray Innes, MG, Pacman 7 Panic Chicken, Saria Melody, and So FP. Special thanks to my generous £10 tier patrons for their continued support. Cade, Daniel Hendricks, D. Rogers, Mike Milton, Side Effect, Robert Hamilton, Roger Mayer, Where Are My Cheetos, and Will Tanner. Thank you all so much. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And a thank you to you for watching, and I will see you all next week. Goodbye.